is Florida. Land of flowers, orange groves, beaches, gunfights, riding porpoises. I first discovered Florida land as a tourist, being taken there by my parents in the mid-1960s. I remember shooting some home movies, seeing the dolphins splashing around in their pool, the Indian fire eater, the Western shootout, all the tacky treats that they had there. Florida land was one of the last vestiges of old Florida, which has now basically completely disappeared. It's the porpoise pool, and what a great playmate he's found. The dolphin show entailed a lot of things that you don't see in dolphin shows anymore, like dolphins wearing floppy hats or dressing up in hula hoops. My name is Malcolm J. Brenner, and this is the story of how I fell in love with Dolly the Dolphin. I've worked as a freelance writer, photographer, and journalist for most of my career. Probably the most productive part of my career was the 10 years I spent in New Mexico reporting on the Navajo Nation, mostly for border town newspapers. That was a fascinating work. It was the early 70s when I was going to New College. I was asked by a woman writer to take some photographs to illustrate a book that she was going to write about the dolphins at Florida Land. It was my first professional gig, really, as a freelance photographer. I met the uh, author at her house in Sarasota, and we took her boat down to Florida Land. Uh, when we got out of the boat, we were standing on the dock looking down at this dolphin. She stared up at us, and we stared down at her, and the writer said, this is Dolly. Malcolm, meet Dolly. Dolly, meet Malcolm. There were no intimations that uh, this dolphin and I would become lovers eventually. I was fascinated. I'd never been that close to a dolphin before. I was enormously interested. I slipped into the water with her. She wouldn't come anywhere near me, of course. Dolphins are usually suspicious of strange people. She stayed on the other side of the pen, and then the assistant trainer uh, began urging me to swim out, to, to take the first move, you know, to be bold, you know. So I struck out to the middle of the pen and sort of chased her around for a while, and finally uh, we ended up in the shallows. Very slowly, she came to the point where I could reach out and touch her. I started rubbing her forehead. She seemed to enjoy that. So I started rubbing her along her back and working my way towards her, her flukes, her tail. And as I was rubbing her and moving my hand towards her tail, uh, Dolly was slowly rolling around her long axis so that by the time that I got midway down her body, I was rubbing her belly instead of rubbing her back. And she swam forward a little bit so that I was rubbing her genital slit, and then she stopped moving. And I thought, oh, this is embarrassing. I just didn't think that that was the kind of show that, uh, you know, parents would be bringing their kids to Florida land to see. She was kept in the uh, sea level pens because she was, at the time, the only dolphin outside of the U.S. Navy that was trained to work in open water. Her part of the show was to swim along with a riverboat in the intercoastal waterway and jump for fish, which her trainer would be holding on the upper deck of this riverboat. It was a really uh, incredible performance. When I would get in the water with her, she would approach me unafraid. She would solicit attention. I never fed her. I never gave her any kind of food rewards. Her courtship, as it progressed, got more vigorous and intense. She would rub her genital slit against me and if I tried to uh, push her away, she would get very angry with me. One time when she wanted to masturbate on my foot and I wouldn't let her, she threw herself on top of me and pushed me down to the 12-foot bottom of the pool. Those were the, those were the tactics that she was trying on me at first. Eventually, she seemed to get the message that that wasn't going to work. She became very gentle. She might open her jaws and run her teeth very gently along my arm or my leg, which produced an amazingly erotic feeling to me, which I think was her way of saying to me, look, I'm, I'm, I'm very strong, but I'm not going to harm you. I knew at that time that there was something different about my sexuality, that it wasn't uh, normal like other guys. I wanted desperately to be normal, to have a relationship with a woman, I first realized I was sexually attracted to animals when my father took me to see a Walt Disney movie called The Shaggy Dog. And strangely enough, I found myself getting an erection at five years old. 
After that, I was aware that there was something different about my sexuality. Zoophilia is Greek for lover of animals. A zoophile is someone in contrast to a bestialist who might just have sex with an animal and walk away. A zoophile is somebody who has tender or caring emotions for their animal partner. My first sexual encounter with an animal came when I was about 11 or 12. I tried to have sex with the family dog, which was a miniature poodle named Miss Clavel. The dog was in heat, so I naively assumed that uh, since she was having sex with a stud dog, she would be willing to have sex with me. Which she wasn't. It was an embarrassing incident. It was not very romantic. After that, I felt basically unclean. I felt like I wanted to take a bath. I wondered what was wrong with me. Why I wasn't having normal male desires for women. It made me feel very embarrassed. It made me feel abnormal. It made me feel like I wasn't one of the guys, you know? Because the other guys would be telling dirty jokes about girls and I just couldn't care. Whatever I was getting from the dolphin seemed very fulfilling, very rewarding. It was like she was the only female who was really paying any attention to me. And that made a tremendous amount of difference to me. At one point, on a particularly cold day, when everybody else was inside the trainer's hut, I found myself thinking, this dolphin's been courting me. I could have sex with her. So I tried. She was passive. She lay in the water and let me try to penetrate her. And I couldn't do it. The water was too cold. I felt very nervous. I felt like we were going to be discovered at any moment. I don't know if anybody is born a zoophile. I think that what made me a zoophile was the very intense physical and sexual abuse I suffered at the hands of a psychiatrist in my youth. Intense prodding, probing, pushing, squeezing of my musculature. He performed fellatio on me when I was about five years old. And I have a very vivid memory of something being forced up my anus. Between this man's inappropriate sexual molestation of me and my mother being kind of a cold, distant character, I think I found animals to be a safe and secure repository, if you will, for my sexual desires. 150 years ago, black people were considered a, a degenerate subspecies of the human being. And at the time, miscegenation was a crime in many states as today interspecies sex or bestiality is a crime in many states. And I'm hoping that in a more enlightened future, zoophilia will be no more regarded as controversial or harmful than interracial sex is today. I successfully made love with Dolly the last visit to the park that I made. The park had been closed down, the property had been sold off, the whole thing was going to be developed into a housing complex. All the dolphins had been shipped out except for Dolly and one male dolphin. They were in a pool together. I went down to the park that day without any real idea whether I was going to be able to make love to her or not, but just hoping that that would happen. We started a very long courtship that lasted about half an hour. Frankly, it was a little difficult to make love with her. There's no backstop in the water. It's a frictionless environment. She was very cooperative. She was very gentle. She was enormously erotic. We played games. We had to try several different positions before we found one that worked, which was her floating horizontal in the water and me being vertical, coming into her from the side that way. And that seemed to work a whole lot better because I could hold onto her back with one hand and hold and guide my penis with the other hand so it didn't slip out of her. Because uh, of the fact that they live in the water, the female dolphin's uh, internal genitalia is a little more complicated than a woman's. They have some waterproofing features in there that you might describe as valves almost. As we started making love, I felt this just intense uh, sense of merging with her on every level emotionally, mentally, physically, spiritually. It's really like we stopped being two individual creatures and became one creature that was making love with itself. I've never experienced such intense intimacy with anyone. It felt transcendental.
it felt cosmic. As I climaxed, Dolly groaned. She made a series of three groans in a rising cadence, and that led me to believe that she had also experienced an orgasm. And I pulled out of her and swam over to the wire fence that encircled the pool. And Dolly swam up to me. She laid her snout on my shoulder. She embraced me with her flippers. And we just stared into each other's eyes for a couple of minutes. Well, when other people claim that I must have raped the dolphin, my response is that you can't outswim a dolphin in the water. Michael Phelps could not outswim a dolphin in the water. Dolphin in the water is in its element. We spent half an hour in courtship. <laughs> if it had been rape, it would have it, been easier for her to stay in the pen where the male dolphin would have protected her from me. Instead, she chose to uh, squeeze between a couple of boards and get into another pen where we had some privacy. And what she ended up wanting to do was make love with me. Their claim that this was rape is based on a, a whole bunch of fallacies. I couldn't find any moral or ethical objections, and I still don't. I think what may have harmed her was that we both developed an emotional attachment. In fact, I think it's fair to say that if I hadn't been involved with Dolly, if I hadn't been in love with Dolly, I never would have bothered to write a book about the experience. If this was just some farm boy with a goat, I'm not sure that's a worthwhile story. I'm pretty convinced that Dolly was also in love with me just from the way she behaved. I'm convinced that we were in love with each other. Excuse me. What happened to Dolly after our relationship was very sad. One morning in June, I woke up from this horrible nightmare that involved dying dolphins trapped in a very dark basement-like setting. I woke up, I literally couldn't breathe. My heart felt like it had stopped beating. I was talking with a relative of the woman writers, and he told me that uh, Dolly had died. I felt like the breath had stopped in my lungs. Later on, when I got a vehicle, I drove to Mississippi and explored the oceanarium where she died. I realized there was just an enormous number of similarities between the oceanarium and my dream. Her trainer told me that she stopped feeding, and then one morning he just came out and found her dead on the bottom of the pen. What you have to understand is that a dolphin's breathing is voluntary. Every breath a dolphin takes, it thinks about. It's not like human breathing, where if we go unconscious, we keep breathing. A dolphin can go into a funk and uh, just stop breathing, and that is apparently what happened to her. She committed suicide. Dolly died of a broken heart. I do feel a lot of responsibility for Dolly's death. I feel like emotionally I should have been there for her. I feel like in a sense I abandoned her because I was too concerned about the feelings of weirdness I was having. I was very much in love with Dolly. I think I was probably more in love with Dolly than I've been with anyone else in my life and less able to be aware of it at the time just because of the strangeness of it. Would I change being a zoophile? I don't know. What I would change, I think, is the ending to the story with Dolly. <laughs>